Welcome back to our channels, Warriors. We are still growing. If you haven't had that homegirl that puts tahin on everything, smash that subscribe button. Go and have her smash it right now. First and foremost, let me give a shout out to the following patrons. Nathan, Scott, Mika Boy, Ramon, John Wick, Marshall, Lead With Love, Johnny, Charles, Albert 12, Soul Star LA, Coach Ken, Miguel L, AI Vega, Claudia, Esquiel, Miguel, Lead Our Actions Under the Christ, Big Bad 48, JT, Nova, Jack, Linda, Michigan Wolverines, Marius, Chevelle 66, Gigi, Abuelita's Journey, Get Well Soon, and Dallas Herrero. If you have not already signed up for that Patreon, make sure you hit that link in the description below. You do not want to be missing out. This episode right here, man. Hector, how were you raised? How were you raised? And I'm not talking about childhood, okay? How I was raised as a child into adolescence. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where I learned how to be the man that I am today, right? Who taught me? Who raised me? This is the answer. This is something I am extremely passionate about. And one of my favorite topics to discuss and talk about. When I was 17 years old, I joined the United States Army, Infantry, 11 Bravo, off to Fort Benning, Georgia to basic training, AIT, advanced uh, individual training or infantry training, whatever it stood for back then, right? AIT, then off to Germany. Yeah, I learned a little bit about leadership in basic training, but it's like shock and awe, man. You're just so new and learning and it's just yelling and push-ups and flutter kicks and running in place and run here, run back. It's not, wasn't really sticking, sticking up here. So I touched down in Germany, new to life, man, 17 years old, new to the army. The year was 2002. I touched down in Germany, Frankfurt, in the airport, December 8, 2002. My platoon at the time, my second platoon, Charlie Company, 118 Infantry, was on leave because they had just returned back from a peacekeeping mission in Kosovo. So there was a couple dudes back. One of them was Specialist Stewart, and the other one was Specialist Ellen. They greeted us there. They greeted us like at midnight is when we got to the barracks. They said, hey, get ready. Three in the morning, you guys got PT. It was fucking freezing cold outside, negative 20 degrees. And yeah, it was on and cracking ever since then. Ellen would later go on to the 10th Mountain Division and get killed in action in Iraq. Roadside bomb. Well, instantly I saw staff sergeants, the rank of E6, young. One of them was Staff Sergeant Hector Leja. The other one was Staff Sergeant Bustamante. The other one was Staff Sergeant Grothen. These dudes were it. They were absolutely it. The tip of the spear. Big Hector. That's what I called him. He called me Little Hector. Uh, Hector Leja was an E6. We were PV1s, E-nothings, right? The lowest rank you can possibly be in the army or in the military. Me and my best man, who was from Arizona, he embraced us. Listen to what I just said. Embraced us, took us under his wing, and would take us out to the bar, to the clubs, to get completely shit-faced. I mean... People talk like they were in college and they used to get drunk. People talk like this and that. There is nothing like getting shit-faced in Germany, right, as a young soldier. And then we would have to come back from the bar straight to PT. Straight from the bar, straight into PT gear and go run 12 miles. Hector, that's not possible. You're lying. You're putting a 10 on your story. Go to hell. <laughs> oh, my God, 
Listen to what the fuck I'm telling you, people. We used to go straight from the bar, drunk as fuck, straight to formation in PT clothes and go run fucking 12 miles daily like it wasn't shit. Yeah, we would throw up along the way. We would go and disappear into the bushes. You would see us come out with one sock because that was us taking a shit and wiping our ass with the one sock, right? Continue mission. Keep pushing. Keep pushing forward. No, that's not where I got that from, right? But it did seem to be appropriate there. Well, I don't know how Hector Leha got a pass, but this dude was never right there running with us. He would always be asleep in his barracks room. The first sergeant loved him. First Sergeant Farrell, who was also, Farrell, Farrell, right, who was also a badass, a dude to be feared, mind you. All these dudes were to be feared, is what the hell I'm trying to say. Well, that's not what I'm trying to say, but I'm just putting, letting you guys know what type of men, warriors, leaders they were. Leha would always be laughing because he'd see us all hung over and sweating it out. But he always took us under his wing. He taught us the ropes. He treated us like sons. And he didn't have to. He absolutely didn't have to. Because of the big giant um, gap in the, in the rank system. E6, E1. But he did. And I am forever grateful for that. I'm telling you, it raised me. It made me who I am today. He didn't walk around with his fucking rank like, oh, I'm an E6, snobby, don't talk to me. Oh, I'm more powerful than you. I'm more better than you because I'm an E6. <laughs> Not once did he mention his rank, but I'll tell you what, on more than one occasion, he did take off his blouse to go fight individuals who, <laughs> who had a problem with him, right? Or with what was going on. So in essence, he took off his rank to show you, hey, Motherfucker, this don't mean shit. You're about to catch an ass whooping. And the dude did know like jujitsu. The dude was with it. He was from Texas. That was Staff Sergeant Leha. Staff Sergeant Leha would eventually go to Haifa Street, Baghdad, and get shot in the head by a sniper and killed. Sergeant Dean, my own team leader, who was my officiant in my wedding. You know, do you take this man to be your lovely wedded husband? Do you take this wife to be your bride? He was our officiant. I talked to him on the reg, right? Not, I do need to tap back. I mean, constantly. We always see each other when I go to Phoenix. When he comes here, he's my brother, right? He was my leader. Just like in prison, you have... Razor wire, concertina, when you're fi- establishing a fire base, an outpost, uh, you want to set up an obstacle. Well, when we would train in Germany out in the field, we'd set up the concertina. The concertina would be there, right, when we're attacking a pretend fire base. Dino's a big dude, big white boy, tall, and uh, a white boy, but he was raised, literally raised by Mexicans, which was kind of cool, I always thought, right? He would put his body, throw himself on top of the barbed wire, the razor wire, with his vest on, where we had a, a bullet, uh, we had ballistic vest. Back then, we had the Vietnam era style one. Then we got the Molly, that was more high speed. Now, you know, now I'm aging myself. He would jump on it so that we can run, stop, step on his back to run across the wire, right? Bridge the, the he would make a uh, breach, the wire, and we can continue mission. I always think like, man, that's cool. That's crazy. Like, I I wouldn't do that, right? But I wasn't as big as him, like tall, wise. And the dude could support all of our weight with all of our gear. That is a leader. Where the fuck else would you see that? Um, Specialist Becker. He'd eventually be a corporal. He'd eventually be a sergeant. Becker. Dude was kind of an asshole with it. But he was a good leader. He just was built that way. He was cool. He was cool, but he can be like kind of <laughs> not cocky. Yeah, cocky at times, right? But I remember in Germany during another training incident, right? This is us training for war, leading up to war, and these men are already performing like that. I remember one time I go down, we had our laser tag. It's called Miles Gear. 
you put the little blank adapter at the end of your M16, you put blanks in there, and when you shoot, it's like laser tag, it goes off, beep, means you're dead, right, you just fucking sit there, don't do nothing, I remember I got hit with the, with the Miles gear, and I remember Becker running over, scooping me up in the fireman's carry position, and hauling me ass and dropping me off at the CCP, casualty collection point, where all the wounded and dead pretend were there, I remember thinking to myself then, damn, these dudes are fucking like about it, right? And I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm, 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 I'm a sponge. Like, fuck yeah. When it was raining, they were out there in the mud, in the rain with us. When it was snowing, Germany snowed, they were out there in the snow with us. When we ate, this is what the fuck I'm getting back to, leadership. And I'm going to tell you how I don't like current times or this civilian life. Or the California Department of Corrections, for that matter. When the food comes, if you're a fucking supervisor or a leader, you are the last one to eat. You understand what I'm telling you? You are the last one to eat. Your troops eat first. And guess what? If you run out of food, oh fucking well. You didn't get to eat. So what? I remember there was a potluck one time at um at Donovan. Not, yeah, Donovan, when I was a PIO, public for Warden Pollard, there was a fucking spread. I remember somebody was lo- coming or going last day or some shit. They had a spread, and I remember Pollard just digging in first, man, and I goes in my head like, fuck, that's fucking disgusting. Like, I'm at a loss of words right now, man, because like, I've already explained that dude's style, but that's just, remember, I remember seeing that shit, right? So all these dudes that I saw be fucking leaders, man. You don't even have to be in a supervisory role to be a leader. And I'll dive into that later on because I've seen plenty of leaders that weren't in a supervisory role where they just, people follow them into the charge. That's another thing. They would never ask me to do anything that they wouldn't do themselves or haven't already done themselves, which is exactly how I carried myself. I never asked my officers to do anything that I wouldn't do or that I have not already done, right? Not shit that's going to get them in trouble, but you know what I mean. If somebody messed up in the army at that time, right? I did not have bad leaders in the army. I talked to a lot of people. They said, oh, I had bad leaders in the military and the Marines, this and that. I did not. I don't know what, by the grace of God, by sheer luck, I did not have bad leaders in the army, in my platoon at that time frame. If you messed up and boy, people were messing up, man, we're young, we're dumb, we're full of, you know what, drinking. They didn't hammer you with paperwork. They didn't destroy your fucking career with paperwork, right? They didn't write anything up and put it in your file that was going to fuck you till the end of time so that you couldn't promote, so you couldn't tra- so you couldn't do, right? They knew better than that. There's better ways to skin a cat, and they taught me that. One time, it was going to be my 19th birthday. It's August 30th. No, it was my 19th birthday, August 30th, 2003, because we were railheading, meaning we were putting Humvees and Bradleys on a train in Germany to go to Bosnia, because we were going to deploy to Bosnia, which we did in September of 2003, and fuck, man, by sheer luck, it was like my birthday, and they just picked me. Hey, you're going to be railheading tomorrow, 0300 hours, 03 in the morning. And I'm like, oh, fuck, right? I got tasked out for a shitty detail. Well, your boy's an alcoholic. Didn't know it then. I know it now. (laughs) I go out to the local bar in Schweinfurt, Germany called Tabasco's. It's not called Tabasco's anymore because I went back a few years with my wife. We went backpacking through Europe. But the place is still there. It's just not called Tabasco's anymore. Well, they made Long Island iced teas there. And I'll be damned anytime any any of us drank a Long Island iced tea, we blacked out. We blacked out. We don't know what happened. We don't remember, right? 
Well, not only did I have a shitload of, of Long Island iced teas, I had a bunch of shots of tequila. It was me and my boy, Jeffrey King. Remember that name, Jeffrey King. Apparently, we get in a taxi cab. Apparently, I start mouthing off and talking shit to the cab driver. He kicks us out. We both get kicked out. So now we're walking back to the base, the barracks. I guess I pass out on the floor. King picks me up like a good battle buddy and starts firing man carrying me, walking me back to the base. Just imagine two drunk dudes walking in a lonely, dark road to the barracks, right to the base. Well, he tells me that he started feeling something warm and wet on his shoulder. <laughs> Here we go. And he's like, what the fuck? Boom, he dumps me, right? This motherfucker's pissing on my shoulder. I pissed on King's shoulder. <laughs> I pissed on his shoulder. Here he was giving me a good, I was a piggyback ride, but a good a fucking fireman carry. <laughs> I got another story about a piggyback ride, but it was a front piggyback ride. I saw two dudes giving each other a front piggyback ride one time. <laughs> Imagine that. So King tells me, hey, you motherfucker, you pissed on my shoulder. Like, Well, I'm in formation, drunk as shit. I walk into CQ. I'm like, woo, I pissed myself, right? So I remember Sart. I am fucking beyond drunk still, lit, right? And Sergeant Grothin, Staff Sergeant Grothin, sees me in formation, looks at me, and he says, go back to your room. I remember the look. I remember the tone. I remember how fucked up I felt. Like, well, not only drunk and hungover, but like, oh, I let this dude down. I fucked up. I fucked up. He never... Talk to me about it. He didn't write me up. He didn't reprimand me. He sent me back to my room. But that alone, that feeling alone is like, I fucked up. I fucked up, man. Like, that's not cool. I let a good dude down. That's not. And that in itself, I never repeated that type of dumb mistake. Right? Except when I came back from Iraq, I went nuts again. But, like I said, I'm an alcoholic. I got 12 years of sobriety now. I, you live and you learn. right? Well, hopefully you do before it's too late. So Jeffrey King ended up going to Iraq, getting hit by an RPG. And then later he would come back to Philadelphia and ultimately he would lose the battle to his demons. Right? He's no longer with us. And that saddens me. But these are all leaders that I met along the way, right? They taught me, they raised me, they showed me how to carry yourself, how to be loyal, how to be honorable, how to look out for your troops, how to look out for one another, not to buddy fuck each other, not to rat on each other, not to throw each other under the bus. Then I joined the California Department of Corrections. Sentinella wasn't that bad as far as like, hey, there was good, I, I was raised right. In the prison system at Sentinella, how to be a CO for sure. In hindsight, in hindsight, right? You don't know it then when you're going through it. Then I go to Donovan. Whatever I just told you guys, I want you to think opposite. I'm talking about, I already told you the warden eating first, right? I'm talking about it's raining outside. You got the fucking captains inside their office, cushy little seat. You got the troops out there, right? As a lieutenant and a sergeant, you bet, you bet your damn ass I was out there in the rain. In the heat, right? With those stab-resistant vests. Um, I told you guys that in the army, they didn't write you up. They didn't fuck you over with paperwork. Well, that's notorious. That's all they do in the Department of Corrections. Like, oh, write them up. Write them up. Write them up. You don't know how many times I was told... By my superiors to write up my subordinates. I never did it. I never did it. Except for one. For one that that buffoon captain. That I let borrow my captain bars. He fucking forced my hand. Like it got, it got pretty bad. And I had to write up an actual good friend of mine. Right. But that 
friend told me, hey, man, I know the game. I know the system. I know it's going to come to a point where you're going to have to write me up. Just do it. I'm telling you, do it because, number one, I don't care, right? But number two, I don't want you to get screwed over because of this. And he's like, it's not that serious. And I'm like, all right, bro, but like, fuck. And that, even to this day, if I see him, I apologize because that didn't sit well with me. And that came from that buffoon, right? There was more like legal shit involved or there could possibly be. It just, I threw my homie a bone by using an old template from 1985 and just fucking up that write up big time, right? I did it on purpose. Gave my friend an out. But I can't stomach it. I couldn't stomach it. I'm fine now because I don't have, I'm not exposed to that on a daily basis. Right, I'm not exposed to it. The whole do as I say and not as I do. The whole vindictiveness. You know what will happen if you see some concertina wire on the floor and the, there's a captain, an AW, a chief, and a warden. You got a young officer. They're going to get that officer and throw his ass on top of the fucking concertina and walk, up, walk all over him, stomp all over him. I couldn't stomach it, right? So I'm one guy. I'm one guy. I couldn't change the system. No way, man. I left. I'm here on YouTube now. It is such a broken system, right? And it even goes above them because they're taking their orders. But at what point does somebody stop and say, hey, enough is enough? This is disgusting, right? I'm going to end it like that. This whole video is a message, right? Send it to somebody that you love, that's a supervisor, that maybe send it to the fucking assholes that need to hear it. Keep pushing forward.